Oh, hello there, and welcome to Phil Talking D20. So, today on the channel, it's another news rundown, plus some other chit chat along the lines of not Gamescon, but the UK Games Expo. I live in the UK, alas, PaizoCon was not an option for me, although I do hear it was a very big success, which is a big thumbs up from me. However, like I said, UK based, weekend just gone, we had the UK Games Expo. Uh, we had a, a lot of people running tables, um, people running D&D tables, uh, they were running Paizo tables en masse. Uh, there were hundreds of different stalls uh, selling a million different kinds of dice, as you'd expect. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, an opportunity to go to some kind of gaming convention without at least a million different sets of dice being available for purchase. Um, highlights that I enjoyed, I got to say uh, hello to the guys down at Merfidious Games where I picked up my new copy of Actung Cthulhu. Ooh, exciting! Uh, I also picked up um, from Unlimited Realms Limited uh, the Deck of Rumours uh, Towns Edition. Uh, so what these are, uh, it's like a deck of random, um, well, I'll, I don't know, I'll show you now by pulling a random card, because that's what you do. Um, so this is simply a rumour. This season's bounty is exceptional. A celebratory feast to thank our deity shall take place this night. And it's basically like a little note that you find maybe pinned to the side of the tavern. Um, they're just wonderful little throwaway fluff cards uh, that have got uh, some might start quests because it might be such and such has gone missing or uh, there's a particular monster that needs dealing with nearby. Uh, some are literally just idle gossip, uh, someone leaving a note, uh, spreading rumours about someone in the village, that kind of thing. Brilliant little fluff throwaways when you need a bit of creativity uh, and you're in a bit of a, a sudden surprise the party have jumped you with a what, what, what do we find when we look around kind of scenario. Um, so they were cool, like those. Um, who else did I chat with? I uh, chatted with the uh, guys behind Twilight 2000, said hello to them at their stall. We played Twilight 2000 very recently, it was a rip roaring success, it was very popular, um, so that's awesome. Does this mean that I am abandoning Paizo? No, not in any way. But as I always say, you should go and play different games. Uh, I often find myself saying that to the D&D 5e community because they seem to be so entrenched in only playing D&D 5e that they will refuse to play any other game system on pain of death, which is very bizarre. But it's not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to dabble in some Actung Cthulhu, preaching and taking my own medicine. Uh, we've had, uh, like I said, Twilight 2000, that was really good fun, uh, run recently. Um, in terms of the news, obviously starting the news off with the obvious one, we'd had PaizoCon. They'd done a hybrid of online and in person, uh, trying to kind of mix up and develop how things kind of play out. Um, obviously Eric Mona gave his keynote speech, there was a lot of good stuff in there. Um, go and watch it, I advise. I won't uh, go into too much detail on that. Um, but I suppose the lowdown is a bit of a rundown on upcoming products. Uh, themed around the dark tapestry. Um, obviously the new book that they're lining up has some adventure paths kind of connecting into it. The Drift Crisis. <gasps> the news continues. Starfinder. I was very kindly given a review copy of The Drift Crisis which is uh, a wonderful kind of dive into uh, Crisis and um, the clues in the name. What they've really kind of aimed that book at is uh, how do you game in a sci-fi apocalypse? Which is an apocalypse we tend to ignore. Uh, obviously Twilight 2000 is a third world war nuclear apocalypse. Um, is set in a slightly alternate history where the USSR and NATO kick off and go nuclear. Terrifyingly relevant in the current times. So the preamble and the build-up to the game of Twilight 2000 was chilling to say the least. Uh, but the Drift Crisis is a lovely, warm and friendly, futuristic apocalypse where you don't have to constantly think, wasn't that in the news last week? Uh, and then question your own sanity. 
Um, but the drift crisis isn't an adventure path. Uh, I think initially a lot of people were going, hey, look at this, it's an adventure path. And it isn't. It is a whole set of possibilities. Um, a whole set of, of different small stories, different takes, different approaches, different settings, all broadly within Starfinder. One of the things that is very hard to initially grasp with Starfinder and sci-fi settings is they are often very, very diverse settings because you have a galaxy instead of like a country or a continent or even a whole world. Galorian does a wonderful job of being uh, a very rich, diverse, evocative world with lots of different locales and lots of different themes but it can only do so much before you run out of room on one planet whereas the drift crisis tries to throw in the angles of science fiction that are reached on various different planets and how uh, a calamitous event such as faster than light travel collapsing how that would affect the societies what effect that would have on distant colony worlds that were only just getting off the ground. What effect that would have on uh, incredibly busy mega trading hubs. What effect that would have on deep space stations. Um, what it would affect, how it would affect corporations, how it would affect, um, you know, citizens. All the different impacts that some kind of monumental crisis like faster than light travel almost completely collapsing and certainly being much much harder to do is something that is is is, is a well, a very cool sci-fi apocalypse and they really go to town on on kind of keystoning all the different kind of ideas and the different kind of narratives that could play out they even push you to consider running uh, multiple campaigns but like little kind of three session, four session, five session campaigns, all telling different parts of the same story, but interconnected different characters. So one group may be the asteroid miners uh, out on the uh, out in an asteroid belt, uh, and the nearby solar system that they would be normally trading with. You you've got two linked locations that formerly very heavily relied on each other with faster than light travel taking food and medicine and, and, and people and resources and equipment out to the miners. The miners then mining and sending their resources that they've mined back to said solar system. With that gap in the middle broken, how do the two survive? And you can have a party on one and a party on another and you tell that story of how both sides try to re-establish contact, try and preserve their families, friends, life support systems, food supplies. You can see how that suddenly kind of starts to spiral. So the Drift Crisis has got a, a great toolbox of what ifs and possibilities and maybe you could and this is how that might kind of advice in it for someone who's looking to to kind of tell something a bit different, not just a a 1 to 20 kind of slogger marathon campaign but a toolbox so that you can build intricate linked stories within this catastrophe that's happened which I really think is proper cool as an idea it's, it's quite a, a brave thing are they releasing adventure paths in, in in the drift crisis yes they are they they are planning on releasing the the kind of the shorter form uh, kind of three to six book kind of shorty kind of adventure paths that they really like doing that are going to tell specific stories within this event but it's not the kind of the be all and end all it seems that really they want people to kind of home brew and experiment and and get inspired by um which i'm all in favor of i think that's a a, a bold move and a, as someone who's not particularly played a huge amount of Starfinder we've never quite got into rhythm with it um, the fact that they are, are are still really exploring what the setting can do and where it can go this obviously far into its development cycle 
is really cool. And what else is quite fun is that you don't even have to have the drift crisis in your Starfinder. Um, it is simply just an optional book that can bring something new to the table. Um, and again, there's rules for navigating in the drift because you eventually you get back into the drift and you can do that. Um, there's a cool bit where they talk about um, people that were in the drift when the collapse happens and they're literally just spat into random planes of exi existence, much like the way Thor, when he's thrown out of the, uh, the bridge fighting um, Hela with Loki, he ends up on the trash world um, where he ends up having to kind of fight his friend Thor. Um, baby arms. Uh, as he gets called. That's a kind of example of what happens when extra planar travel or planar intraplanar travel goes horribly wrong. So there's some artwork that shows like um, a ship's crew suddenly find themselves in the pits of hell uh, and there's like winged demons or devils flying towards them. Uh, so you, again you've got the opportunity for some horror, some 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 classic Robinson Crusoe, you know, or oh, we're gonna do a start we're gonna do a sci-fi campaign, it's gonna be sci-fi, it's gonna be sci-fi, oh spat out, crashed on a desert island planet for all intents and purposes. Actually, it's a grim and gritty survival campaign. Ha <laughs> ha DM uh, tip 101, throw them off the scent. So you've got some really cool options in Drift Crisis to really mix things up and explore um, the sci-fi apocalypse uh, and all its re repercussions. Uh, you've also got coming up, uh, also now available I should say, uh, purchase these now, uh, obviously not from me, I'm not selling them, uh, but you've also got the Knights of Last Wall, uh, not to be confused with the podcast Knights of Last Call, um, who will probably also enjoy this book. They, uh, not the Knights of Last Call, this is the Knights of Last Wall book now, we're going back to the book. That book really dials in on the Knights of Last Wall. Hey, you guessed it. So this book deep dives into the organisation that stood against and stood guard against Torbafon, the uh, unrelenting super evil mega lich of mega doom, uh, who subsequently kicked their ass. So spoilers, uh, didn't work out so well for the Knights of Last Wall. Um, they obviously are still, even after their um, absolute um, ass whooping by the super mega nuclear death lich Tarbothon, they are still an entity. They are, they are still operating, um, even though their like great city has been destroyed and their super castle almost completely shattered to ruin. They have stayed true to their colours, they've stayed true to their oaths. Uh, and they are reorganising, remobilising, and still fighting the good fight. Um, the cool thing with this book is it gives you a big host of uh, NPCs that are within the order. You've got um, a nice juicy selection of uh, player options. Uh, there's a, a lot of fluff about, obviously, that specific unit um, in, in a broad church pro approach. But also lots of other different examples of knightly orders. And there are rules and supplementary kind of information on playing those orders, playing certain kind of key kind of positions within them, guidance on kind of ranks and, and general duties. It's a really good kind of deep dive into kind of how and, and why knightly orders function, which if you are a fan of playing kind of classical um, European based, European history centric fantasy, which the bulk of, um, I suppose, D&D and Pathfinder kind of resonate from um, in the way that Tolkien does as well. I mean, you only have to watch the Lord of the Rings movies or read the books to realise that you've got, you know, knights of plenty. Um, that again king arthur you've got there's a lot of legends that really buy into this this kind of period of of kind of knights in shining armor so for them to kind of gear a book into how you can add that in more rich and detailed ways into your own game it's not a bad thing not a bad thing at all now if you're not interested in knights in shining armor uh, and specifically the knights of last wall well then the book is pretty much a hard pass 
But if you've got that kind of interest in what this book does well is expanding on, again, world fluff, world lore, uh, in the this kind of age of lost omens, if you're really kind of keen to run um, a campaign that is centric around Tor Baffon and the Knights of Last Wall, then this is a really great resource. Um, it works well because they have a, for obvious reasons, the undead lich of undead nuclear death uh, has a lot of undead in his army. So if you've got players sat at the table who have got the Book of the Dead and are using the not undead parts of it, but the kind of the huntery undead elements of it, then this will gel with that very well. Um, conversely, if you're running a campaign where you want to do two campaigns and half of it they're playing evil undead and the other half they're playing good knights, so that you get both sides of the Torbathon Knights of Last Wall kind of story, both those books are going to help you do this chef's kiss with ease. Um, it, it would be a weird campaign to run, the two split, one undead evil campaign, one Knights of Last Wall good campaign. Um, but you could do it, you know, it's an option. So that's, uh, I suppose, those two books touchstone we've um, got the starfinder bug buster bundle that's currently in the final stages on uh, humble bundle uh, so you're getting a big discount on a lot of content the most impressive bit though um, is that we are currently at a standing tally of around 15 grand raised uh, via this hum humble bundle deal uh, that's all starfinder all the time um, there's a huge amount of stuff. There's Adventure Path books, there's flip mats, um, there's the GM screen, there's Alien Archives, there's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of content here. Um, obviously, it's one of those things that tiers and it starts at 3 98 and it goes up to a whopping, in obviously, UK pounds, maybe different in your particular region, uh, £37.87, but £37.87 is a huge amount of content. It's about 340 quid's worth of content for that. So if you're sat on the fence about Starfinder, if there's only a couple of books that you own and you want a chunk more books, this is a good place to go and get it because it's also raising money for charity, which in my opinion is never a bad thing. So by all means, check out the Humble Bundle deal. Um, you've got a, a handful of days left, four or five days left. Um, but yeah, that's been doing really well. Uh, other news and developments. Um, so this is one I actually saw whilst I was at uh, the UK Games Co uh, co uh, Convention. Uh, and that it is um, Archon Studios have produced a load of um, 3D terrain. Uh, for the Abomination Vaults. So you can buy box sets of terrain. You can buy the recently released um, great big, thick, hardback dungeon uh, Abomination Vaults um, d mega dungeon complete adventure. So all the books in one mega book. Um, and you can buy this terrain from uh, Archon, uh, what they call Archon Studio. And then you can proper map mini 3D studio terrain abomination vaults your head off, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, so like I said, um, abomination vaults, uh, the, the full adventure arc in hardback is now currently available, as is that cool 3D terrain. So again, in terms of things that are being added to Paizo's bow, this kind of sudden jump into branching out and reaching out to these third party companies to expand what Paizo can bring to our hobby is pretty damn impressive. Uh, like I said, I was pretty impressed with the, uh, the, the terrain samples that I saw at uh, the UK Games Expo. Uh, I didn't pick any up uh, because I had a very small budget and a very limited amount of time. And I haven't got time in my slate at the moment to run Abomination Vaults. Although good things are heard about it on a regular basis. And if you're a 5e player, hey, you can get Abomination Vaults in 5e. Woohoo! So you can get into all the world lore 
uh, and all the, the kind of the setting and the history of the fluff and start getting a taster for Galorian, but you can do it in clunky, horrible, awkward 5e rules. Uh, because, you know, why play Pathfinder 2e when you can ruin Abomination Vaults with 5e? Um, but, you know, it's good for Paizo because they're stealing money from wizards. Uh, and not just wizards, they're not going down the street mugging wizards. Um, actual wizards of the coast. Wizards that live by the sea. Uh, they're the only ones they want to mug with that. So, um, obviously, that's a, a pretty healthy dose of um, events and, uh, and what have you that have been coming through fairly thick and fast uh, in my inbox. Um, yep, yeah, covered that one. Yeah, I'm doing a good job here. Um, Shadows at Sundown, a new adventure arc uh, starting up. Um, built off the back of the Curse of the Crimson Throne. Uh, this is just a never-ending saga of stuff happening. That's why I'm having to do these kind of interdispersed uh, kind of news videos, um, because there's a lot to talk about with Paizo. But I feel that I've done Paizo a good service. The, we've covered all the major talking points, we've reached out and discussed a bit of PaizoCon, we've touchstoned uh, the Drift Crisis, which I think was getting a little bit of, uh, of flack, a bit of uncertainty, early doors, um, but I don't know why, I think it's a really well put together product, it's very much a, you could try this, it's not a being hit in the face with it and saying, you can no longer play the Starfinder game you want, you must play Drift Crisis. That's not how this product is built at all. Um, it's been nice to um, give some smaller companies a shout out. Unlimited Realms uh, Limited, love that. Um, they do a whole range of these card decks, not sponsored. I bought these with my own money. Um, so they um, they do towns, they do uh, what they call call to arms, which is like a whole deck of like plot hooks for quest going off and being dragged into a quest. They do one for villages, rural encounters, city encounters. I went with towns because it's kind of in the middle. There's probably something that's useful in it most of the time. Uh, but I thought that was a fun pickup. Um, Modifius Games, um, Actung D20, uh, which is this kind of um, Cthulhu World War II uh, occult um, but pulp action game which is why it caught my my eye um you know is there a cthulhu horror yes uh are there uh like laser rifle well i say laser yeah there are laser rifles well they're not laser rifles they're like electro kind of tesla weapons uh yes it's got those kind of trappings of uh, wolfenstein uh castle wolfenstein or um kind of Indiana Jones, where there's always something a bit more kind of weird going on just beneath the surface. Um, so I started having a flip through that. There is a 2d20 system, so 1d20 was not enough for Mephidius Games. Uh, they thought that um, 1d20 was for the weak, and they would have 2d20s. Uh, and to confuse matters further, the 2d20 system relies on rolling low, so a 1 is good and a 20 is bad just a really mess with people that are used to a 1d20 system living in the in the ancient past that they are the uh 2077 cyberpunk uh future is 2d20s rolling low um but that's enough about my silly um shenanigans about that Acton cthulhu uh i will at some point uh be posting up a review of that once I've got kind of stuck into it. Um, same for Twilight 2000. So if you're into your kind of your military kind of history, you like your kind of your Cold War uh, kind of it periods in, in history, uh, and you fancy being a desperate and forlorn survivor in a nuclear wasteland where your survival is measured in how many days water and food you have and how many bullets for your gun you have to fend off the savage, lawless, uh, and generally kind of grim inhabitants of a nuclear wasteland, then that's the game for you. Uh, it's really cheery, honest. 
And it, it is genuinely Twilight 2000, genuinely a good game. Um, that is also not a D20 system, or even a 2D20 system. Who knew? Uh, it is a traditional kind of D6-esque system uh, with dice pools, but you accrue D6s or D8s or D10s or D12s depending on your rank to give you a bit of an insight into it. And then it'll be things like an ability plus a skill will be your skill pool, and you'll roll the dice and you have to get sixes, and Bob's your uncle, if you get ten or more, it's two successes, and we would go from there. But, in terms of um, broadening our horizons and, and getting some time to do some other stuff, Paizo and, uh, obviously, Pathfinder 2E are my bedrock of gaming, and they will be for the very, very foreseeable future, but having a handful of sessions here and there to throw into something new is important, and I do preach that on this channel, so I would like people to also feel free to do the same. Uh, unless you're a 5e player, then never stop playing 5e, and always try and claim that you can run anything in 5e, you just have to change all of the rules of 5e until there are no 5e rules left, and then it's still 5e. But is it? Anyway, enough of my bashing of the 5e community. I do enjoy it. Uh, don't take offence. Um, play some Acton Cthulhu. Uh, maybe they do a 5e version. Uh, like Abomination Vault. Sway back to Paizo. We've got a full circle. So, hopefully you've enjoyed my newsy ramblings. If you perhaps wandered past me and realised uh, after the event uh, that you saw my bearded face uh, at the UK Games Expo, hello! Um, obviously, uh, stay tuned for more reviews upcoming. Uh, and in the meantime, stay classy, stay safe, and I will catch you on the next video. Peace.